Okay, thank you. Uh, while we're waiting for other leaders to log in, uh, my colleague, um, Bayon Lee, I mean, uh, Leonard, will be coordinating together with me in case of uh, uh, bad network, in case of the network goes off, and, and then he will take over, or he will stand in for me anyway. So, okay. yeah, so he's, he's already in, and he's also a co-host here too. So what, I think what's his name? I'm sorry, what's his name? His name is Leonard. Leonard, okay. Leonard, yeah, he's here. He's a co-host too. Okay, nice to meet you, sir. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Michael. Very good. All right, so do you, I, I think he's already uh Few minutes after six, I think it's it's better we start now, so that we can. So I introduce us to Michael. Michael will be taking us on um, today's topic. As um, usual, we will be having this program series. So Michael will be taking us today's topic with us on how computer models affect economics and liberty. So thank you very much, Michael, for joining us. You are welcome to African Student for Liberty. Uh, and we are glad to have you as uh, our speaker for today. So you're welcome. Thank you, Michael. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. So um, thank you all for taking the time. I'll just spend uh, one minute. Um, my name is Michael Malgeri. I live in California. Um, I'm actually in the software industry, but um, I wrote a couple of children's books that you may have heard of. And I'm an advocate of free markets and free enterprise and capitalism. So again, it's an honor to be here and let's get into the topic. So yeah, this is the, we're going to talk about how computer models affect economies and liberty. And let me switch the slide. There we go. So just a couple of um, sections here. We'll, we'll go into computer models. And then what I want to do is give you examples of uh, reliable computer models. I'm not going to make the distinction between good and bad. Let's call them reliable and less reliable. So we'll have uh, some categories there. And, and then we'll get into the closing remarks in a Q&A. So not a lot of things to talk about, but um, I think they'll be interesting. So first, let's define what a computer model is. Uh, now, there are a lot of definitions out there. This is one I put together. It's a mathematical representation of an aspect of reality. Models, like anything, um, make a representation of what exists uh, out there in the real world. Now, you may recognize these two individuals here. This is Isaac Newton. Um, he modeled something very important. He didn't do it on a computer. We didn't have computers back then, but he came up with the equation force equals mass times acceleration. And that formed the basis for a lot of the advancements that we see today. Right. And I'm sure you know this person here on the right, Albert Einstein, famous physicist. Uh, his famous equation was E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. That also was very important in the major advancements that we see today. And what you need to know is that models are just a virtual representation of reality. Uh, and when we put them in mathematical form and run them on the computer, they can help economics and liberty and a lot of other things. So let's go over some of these examples, some of the what I call reliable computer models. And we've got several different uh, categories that we'll talk about. So these are nice pictures. Anyone that goes on the web and searches for something like computer models or computer engineering can pull up the same thing. This is where I got these from. Uh, and you can see the top right, this is an automobile simulation. That's a race car. Uh, what they're modeling there is um, speed and wind resistance and thermal uh, effect on, on the vehicle. And they're doing this before the car even exists, before any prototype exists. And you can see at the bottom, same thing for an airplane. Isn't it great that they could just see what, how an airplane is going to perform uh, before they even uh, manufacture it? Uh, it really lends to the safety uh, and, and impacts the economics of, of that, uh, of, of an airplane. And, and in the top right, that's recognizable as a, as a bridge or some type of structure that's going to hold trains and cars. 
bottom right, that's a person within a vehicle. You can imagine how the impact safety. And then in the center here, you can see how many parts, this is just in an engine. You can actually see how these are gonna to fit together and if they're, they're building it correctly. So that's an engineering. This is a little bit more fun, although engineering is very fun. We all know about movies and special effects. This in the middle was the very first entirely computer animated film, Toy Story. I remember when I saw Titanic in the upper left, it was just like we were really there. So amazing special effects, computer models. This one interesting in the bottom right, Star Wars. This person on the right, Peter Cushing, he is actually deceased, but they were able to use information about him from old photos and, and create him in one of the most recent Star Wars movies. And you got a couple of others on the right here. So these are pretty good examples of what computer models can do. Um, operations research. So over on the right here, this is a smart factory. Uh, there's a phrase here called digital twins. What engineers and planners can do is actually model uh, an entire factory and they could see how the supply chain, if it's operating efficiently, um, if there's going to be delays, uh, handle things like supply shortage or, or, or breakdowns in some of these equipments. Every one of these pieces of equipment and even the part, they're instrumented to send data and that data feeds into models to, to make this factory a smart factory. Now on the left, something we don't like to talk about is war, and this is war games. This actually comes from an old movie, I think in the 80s, but better to simulate war than to actually have war. So maybe some of these models can um, you know, save lives. Uh, now, this is a really good discussion about models. Right there in the center, that's, picture of the atom. I don't know if it really looks like that, but that's what they think it looks like. This is a model that was developed well over a hundred years ago. There were no computers around then, but it laid the foundation for what you see on the top right here. Those are the old transistors. Some of you are not uh, as old as I am, but that used to be in the back of television sets. And that gave way to the integrated circuit, uh, which you all know, um, helped us produce the internet and laptops and iPhones and what's coming down the pike here are intelligent robots, hopefully make life easy for us. And I, I threw this in, this is Rocket Man from uh, Elon Musk. They launched that earlier in the year or last year, floating out in space. Um, and up at the top left is uh, a version of the rocket that they think is gonna take humans to Mars. So this all, uh, a lot of it is made possible by um, some good theoretical work, but models that people can um, understand these uh, difficult tasks and build these incredible devices and take on these amazing projects that we see happening. So what's the message here? Why are these models valid? M meaning why do they work? Well, the factors that go into the model are very well known and they're very well understood. So when we talk about, will a bridge fail? We know the material strength of steel and aluminum and the other things that go into that. Uh, on an automobile or in an airplane, we know the, con the heat conductivity. Uh, we know the inertia of a car careening around a curve. So these are things that we could put in mathematical form and have the computer test out for us. And the most important thing about these models that if someone makes a prediction about it, you can test it. So you can run the simulation, you can make predictions, but then you can actually build a prototype to say, okay, you said this bridge was not going to fail under this load. Well, let's make a small prototype of it. Let's see how it does. And then if you were wrong, you go back uh, and fix things. But it's, um, it's very important that these things could be tested. So, Remember, the title was, what are the impact of these models, these reliable models on economy and on liberty? Well, you can imagine that if you could simulate something in a computer many, many times before you build prototypes, you really can cut the cost, um, which is important for any business. And then you reduce the risk. Better to simulate something, war games or factories or bridges, so that you don't have to build something and you're not sure of it and people can actually die. So reduce risk, it increases safety, Luxuries becoming commodities. Um, when I was growing up, uh, computers were about $10 million. <laughs> and now, what everyone holds in their hand in, in iPhones or Samsung devices, 
you know, they're only a couple of hundred dollars. So they become commodities. Um, and innovation is very important. Every, some of you may have 3D printers. We've put these powerful devices in the hands of consumers. And now the average person can be an innovator and invent things. So what's the impact on liberty? Well, I just told you, it, it empowers individuals. You don't have to rely on corporations, uh, these other scientists. It, it, everyone can, has a computer, has a laptop, can start modeling things, can get into the science. Uh, it definitely enables more choices. I like to tell a story about when I took up running in the, in the 70s, I'm giving away my age here, but there was only two or three pairs of running shoes that you could buy. Now, if you go into one of these superstores, there's hundreds of shoes that you could buy. It costs not much greater than what I used to pay for them. And these uh, advances are motivated mostly by science as opposed to politics, uh, which is very good. It keeps uh, societies free. They solve fundamental problems and they're not motivated by fear. They're motivated by the desire to just improve our lives. So these are the most reliable models. And um, a little bit of statistics here. If you look in the lower right, 1940, the global GDP was estimated about 7.8 trillion. So right around 1940, we go up the curve a little bit, 1950, 1960. So 1966, that's when computers and software and modeling came into starting to get mainstream. And you could see the growth in uh, the gross domestic product. And right, we're right around 2019, we're getting close to $90 trillion. So very good indication of um, what technology, the, the reliable use of it, the proper use of it can do for society. Okay, so now we get into examples of less reliable models. And, I, and I've got two. Uh, we're all in the middle of this coronavirus crisis, and that has been driven, um, well, our, our reaction to it has been driven by these epidemiology models. And for those of you that don't know what epidemiology is, I've got it at the bottom of the branch of medicine, which deals with the incidence distribution, possible um, contagious diseases, and other factors related to health. So it's important. It's important to try and model what's going to happen with the disease and how it spreads. I'm not denying that, okay? And then we all have climate change models as well. So let's, let's start with the first one. Um, many of you may have seen this. Uh, this was the curve that we all had to flatten. So the theory was that if we didn't respond and have this economic lockdown worldwide, that the hospital systems would be overwhelmed. We'd have this red curve here, and the number of cases would increase. And and they had to revise their model. I think they're down to a prediction of 60,000 miss. Now, well, I'm not saying that their intentions weren't good, but this model was not reliable. And what, it re and what happened is that for the last month or more, we have um, taken a severe hit on our economy. So we need to learn from this the next time. Now, Here's an interesting thing. This is the epidemic calculator. And I'll send these slides out to all of you, uh, but you can play with this URL. Let's take a look at it. Are you guys hopefully are seeing this browser? This is the actual one of the models that people use. And you can play with the different factors that go into. So let's look at this, what's called the R naught, the basic reproduction number. Look how you change that slightly. Look how the predictions change, the death rate, just by changing one theoretical factor, the transmissions times, right? The curve gets flattened, it gets wider, it moves. The mortality statistics, completely different shape. And these are all, I won't call them all guesses, but they are not 
with the certainty, they are not, this is not a model that has the certainty of the computer generated model, I'm sorry, the, the computer engineering models that we looked at the last time that measure stresses and strains on bridges and, and um, cars going around curves. And they don't have anywhere near the number of factors going into this model that they could have. So is it a good model? Should we keep using it? I think we should keep developing it but we should not rely on it to make these major decisions. And here's something I pulled up about a half hour ago before this um, webinar. Uh, a couple of studies, you guys can go to this URL, that the antibodies suggest that coronavirus rate may be much higher than previously believed. Well, that means that a lot of more people are infected, which, and the death rate is not as high. So it, very how many people die over the number of people are infected and it's showing that um, this is not as bad as they thought it was the excuse me the second article says comes right out and says it the lethality is much, not much different than the season again this is what we call in the u.s uh, monday morning quarterbacking uh, relating to the football game it, it's after the fact, I know, and I know people have to make tough decisions, but it doesn't mean we can't learn from it and do better next time. All right, now we get into the climate change models. And um, if you're in school, uh, that was developed in 1999, and it predicted it was well, it showed a correlation around, it was greatly increased, and it was correlated with um, carbon dioxide, human use of carbon dioxide, right? Turned out that this model uh, was not correct, and you can see the comments here on the right. Uh, uh, they missed very figures, but practices in analog has been early uh, debunked, but yet it forms the basis of, of uh, a lot of political policy to counter that model. And what it should a responsible way and to the use of fossil fuels and the use of energy in, in society. So very important. To see actual data and how it compares to these models now. We talked a little bit about that one. The reason is there are many, many more factors to take into account. Could think about what you would have to know about the the global the science of the of the earth and all the factors that might co come in to affect the weather uh, there are 800 million square miles of surface area on the earth and we're only taking temperature readings at, at a small fraction of those so again uh, many many more More factors to take into account when trying to model of it, just not reliable. And those factors are just not well known. That's important. But the most important thing is in the epidemiological model, when someone says two million people are going to die in the US, how skeptical of those things. The same thing with the climate change. The temperature is going to go from 0.5 degrees or to 4 degrees. Well, that's an amazing range. That's a very big claim. They talk about sea level rise. So give the scientists that are opposing those views a, 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 um, a hearing. Because these, predi these predictions are very difficult to test and to verify, and they have very big impact on economies and liberty. Okay, so what are these, why are these models reliable? What's their impact? Well, you can imagine that they raise cost. If we were to move away from fossil fuels, 
um, that would be a tremendous cost to the society. Uh, look at the cost we're taking right now by shutting down our economy for, uh, we're into it about a month now. There's trillions of dollars that are lost, people are unemployed. There's a lot of hardship happening there. Uh, and that decreases safety when you don't have the wealth uh, to respond to different situations. Uh, that could be very bad. And here's something I like. Commodities, things that used to be commodities are becoming luxuries. And I gave an example of toilet paper. I don't know how things are uh, where you live, but it's very difficult to get toilet paper around here. You have to, you have to um, either order it on the web or go wait uh, online early in the morning. So that's the impact on the economy. And what's the impact on liberty? Well, we've had some of our rights restricted. Uh, we're allowed to go out. We can walk in the street, but we can only go to stores that are deemed essential. The movies are closed. The restaurants are closed. The beaches are closed. Uh, and again, this is not driven. Well, I won't say it's not driven by science, but it's driven by a scientific model that is very, very uh, unreliable in its early stages. Um, the claim here is that it's driven more by, by politics and fear and a lot of power is being concentrated in a few that can happen. You look at the picture on the left, it's showing that the U.S. at the time had 123,000 um, cases. I'm not sure if that's, de no, it's not deaths, but it's cases. But if you look at the one on the right, it's a different interpretation of that uh, because we, there's over 300 million people here. So we're really down at the bottom. So this is a, the graph on the left is meant to motivate people or to scare people into complying. Here, uh, a couple of other um, pictures. The person on the right was once Obama's chief of staff and he just came out right and said, it, uh, don't let a serious crisis go to waste. And on the lower left here is uh, Joe Biden. He is, looks like he's going to be the Democratic candidate. And um, he's looking to leverage this opportunity here. So these are the things you have to watch for and at least raise your voice. And hopefully we'll, we'll be doing that here in the US. Okay, okay. so some closing footprint. No one will ever try to fill your shoes. That, that's something I came up with for uh, my book, John, um, Warm This. And essentially, um, filling somebody's shoes is uh, an expression for someone that does something very good, maybe a great achievement, and they say, well, though, if you're following up in that person's footsteps, those are hard shoes to fill. Meaning, uh, you want to try and be like that person. It's going to be difficult because they've achieved something good. Well, you're not going to be able to fill a person's shoes if you don't make an impact, if you make a small footprint if you're shy, if you don't speak out, if you don't take risks, if you don't try. So that's what that um, saying is supposed to convey, I hope it does. Uh, but with regard to models, models can be very useful tools. Uh, I obviously support the ones that are reliable. I even encourage the ones that are not reliable to continue development. Maybe someday they will become reliable. I'm against the current decisions that have been made based on them. Uh, and I think there'll be a lot uh, said and written about uh, climate change, of course, and the, um, the epidemiological models. But the key message is don't let the models be the masters. Stay in control. Don't be afraid to um, express an opinion. Raise your voice. Do it respectfully. and um, move forward. Uh, there's a lot of good things that can come, come from, from these models and analysis. Humans are very, very curious. But again, don't stay silent if you think something is uh, not what it should be. So what do I got left here? Oh, that's my website, kidsforbiz.com. Hopefully you guys can visit that. And yeah, if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take a few, Owen. Hope that was um, some good slides here. Thank you very much, Michael. That was a good one. And uh, I've really learned so much about uh, computer models, liberty, and economics. I mean, it's, it's an amazing insight. And there are so much lessons, I believe, that our leaders have taken from here. So we'll give them some few moments to drop questions. Um, for
some some persons are coming because of the network of my leaders. So if you if you have question, please kindly drop your question here so that we can relate to Michael. Thank you. And Roland, I'll send you a copy of these slides. Uh, I've made a few changes. You're you're welcome to distribute them if you can. If no you problem. Can. Yeah. No problem. I will, I will do that. I will do that. Yeah. There's a lot happening, particularly with the um, the coronavirus uh, crisis. Uh, new information comes in every day, and um, it's good to watch it and see how these models have uh, have changed since the beginning. Okay, um, I, I, I going through your your slide. I, I really wanted to conf I, really, I want to ask a question that. Um, um, in economics, which happen to be a few that um, I've looked into, uh, many models are used to es es I mean, explain economic uh, functions. Can we say that some of those models have been used to predict uh, futuristic uh, behaviors of market demand and supply? Uh, sometimes, as as someone that's having a knowledge in that cause, I feel that some of those uh, those models are not correct. They are not actually accurate. Yeah. Like you said earlier, it gets yeah, fear. You, Can you hear me, Mike? Yeah, were you talking about, did you say insurance models? Is that what you were talking about? Economics model, yeah, Economics and insurance model, models yeah. too. Well, yeah. you, here's the difference. Many large organizations, uh, multinational corporations, rely on economic predictions. Um, insurance companies use, use mathematical models to predict who they want to insure. They're called actuarial models. The, the big difference is the risk is, is, in, is for the company, right? They're the ones that are going to make investment. They're using those models to make, construction company might do a, have an economic model and decide, okay, are we going to invest several billion dollars in an airport? Well, airports are, uh, you know, in buildings Hello? or, or uh, a housing. I hear you. Go on, go Hi, on. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the point is that the risk is focused and they do the diligence and they're the ones that are either going to profit or lose based on the investment and the economic. Model. The same thing with an insurance that is a high risk, they will be the ones to city. So those models, even though they may be less reliable, again, the risk is contained in the people that, uh, in the investors. Okay, we have a question here from one of our leaders and the question goes by, how does one test the validity of models? Well, it's difficult with the last two that we talked about, the epidemiological model. And the climate change model, but the engineering. So if I create a bridge component and model it as an engineer, um, I modeled uh, some structural uh, components and I told my boss, okay, this is, this is how these beams are gonna react. And what they did was after they were satisfied, they went and they actually built prototypes. So in hopefully in many of these uh, engineering models, you can build an act, a prototype, uh, which is a real world version of the computer module and test it and then see if you were correct. So that's, those kinds of models can be tested. It's very difficult to test climate models. And that's why there's danger there in making major policies on them. Okay. So there's another question here that says uh, uh, that uh, models are scientific facts, but how can mere opinion? be considered how come well i'm sorry well okay models not scientific you can build a model and some of it is based on in models particularly uh, many of the data models that are used today in machine learning um there's a process called normalization that they do they try to they collect lots 
and lots of data. Uh, another way of saying they try to simplify it and standardize it. Um, and you lose a little bit uh, when it comes to making that a representation of reality. Now, I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying they're not good because if you look at some of the speech recognition technology that we have today, the image recognition technology, those are based on mathematical models doing very, very well. Again, the key difference is you, you could test it. So if I have an image, rec uh, if I have a model that is supposedly will recognize images, I could run through thousands of images and see if it's correct or not. And they're getting much better, as we all know. Same thing with speech okay. recognition. I have a question for you. Um, about uh, uh, models affecting liberty and individual rights. Now, I want to, I want to really uh, ask that in terms of technology, like we have, we've been having a case of the 5G network in Africa. In the case of Nigeria, the government is uh, that 5G is not a good technology for the people, based on the fact that uh, is, uh, it has a negative impact on the human population. So, with such kind of assumption, can we say? such uh, information is it's uh, it could be a model trying to predict what is expected to happen in the nearest future or that is just a mere opinion or a considered opinion well yeah you have to look at it from the technology benefits and, and then there's the political aspect of it I, I you know five the reason we have 5g and why we need it is because um you know, in, in the last uh, 30 years or so, humans have been on the internet with their telephones and computers. But now that smart factory that I showed you, that's an example of every device, every product, pretty much everything is going to be in, in internet enabled and is going to be sending data back to the people that are going to analyze it. And 5G is a technology that's going to be able to have the bandwidth uh, to be able to accept that data. So from a technology standpoint, it's, it's a good thing because um, analyzing data is good, but it could also be used for, you know, for not so good things. If you're, if you're monitoring the citizens, if you're, you know, uh, trying to uh, in, inflict down their privacy or infringe on their privacy, it can't, so, so again, there's two aspects of it. There's the technology aspect of it and there's the political aspect. I don't know what the motivation is in, in your country to stop it and what the reasons are, so I, I really can't comment. But like any other technology, it has to be used um, reliably. Uh, hopefully I'm not dancing around that <laughs> issue. But that's the best okay. way I can answer that. All right, thank you. Uh, well, we'll have another question before my own one, the last question I'm going to uh, ask yeah. you. Somebody is saying that, one of our leaders is asking, auditing and accounting for climate change towards a trade-off between economic output and climate footprint. Will computer models still support production to meet consumption needs for the growing world population? That is one question. Well, what, that question was, do I support what? Re reduction or, or re what was the question? I'm sorry. Auditing and accounting for yeah. climate change. So what's the trade-off between economic output and climate footprint? Okay. Will computer... towards a trade-off between economic output and climate footprints. Will computer models still support production to meet consumption needs for the growing world population? Okay. okay. That's it. Yeah, so, so right now, the majority of computer models are saying that if we keep uh, our current rate of fossil fuel use, that there's going to be climate catastrophe. Um, and 
there are and there are a lot of other scientists that believe otherwise that fossil fuels uh, and CO2 production are, are not the cause of climate change, although they do have an impact. Um, they're not the dominant cause. There are a lot of other factors that affect climate change. There are some scientists that believe if the world warms, that it's a good thing. I mean, CO2 is the food of, of plants and forests and trees. And so it's the food of, of um, many of the things that, that we rely on. So there needs to be a lot more discussion about that. And in terms of energy, the world uh, needs energy, more and more energy. We cannot um, address any problems that might occur. They're not sure that they will occur. We can't address problems that might occur by cutting out the very foundation of, of our, one of the very strong foundations of our society, and that's energy. I showed you that graph um, that showed from the early 1900s how the world has progressed in terms of wealth and how many people were brought out of poverty. And that's a direct correlation to the use of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are the, the least expensive, most reliable source of energy, and we cannot cut that off. So there needs to be a lot of scientific discussion and political discussion around that before we make any drastic moves. All right. Thank you very much. Now, I have one question for you from, have you said that uh, on the global scale, that uh, on the global scale that computer models uh, have, have kind of uh, be, have a negative, uh, more negative impacts on the individual liberty and the world economy. Can we conclude by saying that there is more negative impact from the computer models? I, I, I would, I, boy, I couldn't, that would be a guess. Um, based on, in the engineering world, it's definitely been more positive. The, the things like entertainment and engineering and operations research definitely the, the the effect has been tremendously positive um models that we talk about the epidemiological model I, again i'm not opposed to that i think they could help make good decisions uh, as long as we keep them limited I, this particular decision that was made um I, you know i'm I think there was another way. I don't think we needed to shut, we had to shut down the economy. But again, that debate will rage on for years to come. So I would, I would say overall it's been positive and we should okay. continue with computer modeling for sure. It's like anything else, there's responsibility that comes with a, a, a power that you have. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Mike. It's a pleasure to have you here today, educators on the, um, the relationship on computer models and yeah, economics and individual liberty. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to having you more and more to share more knowledge and um, how to improve liberty. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'll be bringing the meeting to an end. So for uh, further questions that are not here, yeah. I will send to you and you will give answers and I will send back. So for the presentation, when you send the presentation, we are going to send to all leaders present here. Thank you very much, Mr. Mike. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of the top leaders in ASFL, I, I say very big thank you to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Have a nice day. Everyone stay safe. Bye. All right. Thank you. All right. Leon. Thank you, Leon, for your